In the 1940s, men lied about their age so that they could go fight in World War II. Today, men lie about their gender so they can beat girls in sports. The USA Today published a study that suicide rates in 2023 were at an all-time 80-year high. We have not seen this large a percentage of suicides since the Great Depression. I don't think anybody talking about it. To the worst case, they, they think it's fitting. They're getting what they deserve. That's what's wrong with this generation today. Do you know that it's our job to take care of a woman and some children to have a family? That's our damn job. But what happens to them when the woman tell you, I don't need a man, Steve? Who don't need no man? I've got young men growing up in this oh, yeah. culture that's basically telling them not only are you useless, yeah. but you're the problem. And this is for fathers, grandfathers, uncles. This is for pastors. The world needs your presence. Yeah. Like the world is a better place because you're in it. Dr. Williams, top hey. of the day to you, brother. How are you? Yeah, Dr. Harper, I'm doing good, man. How you doing, bud? I'm good, man. Hey, I got a question for you. Okay. What do you love most mm. about being a man? Woo! That's a good question. That's a hard question. <laughs> and I'll say this. No one's ever asked me that question before. I believe it. And even the assumption that I do love that I get to be a man, you know, is in that question. But here's one thing I love, and this is a, sometimes a hard thing, but when I read through Scripture, I see there's this great calling for the women of our day. And I see there's this great calling for the men of our day. And, and I see that those callings and those roles and how that's fleshed out is different. And I look at my wife, and she thrives at being the woman God has called her to be. Like, if there's a woman right now who seems to be getting it right and being the woman she's called to be, I think it's my wife, right? She She's just thriving in that. And so I love that there's a calling for me to be a certain kind of man, to lead my family, provide for my family, protect my family, to serve them, to love them in a certain way. And so I, I love getting to strive after that. And yeah. I'll be the first to admit, there's a lot of days I get it wrong. There's a lot of days I fall short of that. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure my kids would echo that. Huh. But but I love there, there's a biblical expectation and biblical call for me to live a certain way as the man that God called me to be. Dude, I, I absolutely love that. And I know, based upon Scripture and just real life, that when your wife is at her best, mm. you're at your best. Yeah. And when you're at your best, walking in your for, full design, she's at her best. Yeah, it sharpens one another, it, encourages one another. That's right. It truly is a compliment. That's good. Um, a compliment to one another. And, and today, in today's show, man, we're going to kind of – not kind of, we're going to ring the alarm mm. because men are not at their best today. Mm. Yeah. They're just not. I, I recently read a study uh, in the USA Today. The USA Today published a study that suicide rates uh, in 2023, okay, the last year, were at an all-time 80-year high. <sighs> we have not seen this large a percentage of suicides since the Great Depression. 80 years. Great Depression was the last time. Last time. And 79% of those suicides were from from men, middle-aged men. What? 79. 79. And and as I was reading that that morning, I thought, oh, wow, like, you know, this is going to appear in the New York Times, CNN, Fox News, MSNBC. Wow. This, like, is, this is news. Like, Groundbreaking like, like this news. Is, like, this is probably like somebody should call the president and let him know, hey, when people kill themselves, it's largely middle-aged men doing it. Like, Eight out a of problem. ten. Eight out of ten. That should have sounded the alarm. 100%, but I didn't find it anywhere. They were the only news source to pick it up. And 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 this is what I believe. And, and this is a personal opinion, right? Mm -hmm. But I believe that the reason why no one else picked it up is because there's an underlining conviction in our country that men are getting exactly what they deserve. Mm. They, they, they didn't find it newsworthy. They didn't find it tragic. In fact, maybe they found it fitting. 100%. Eight out of 10 of those suicides are men. And Well, Nancy Piercy, she exposes this attitude in our culture in her book, uh, The toxic war on masculinity right yeah. everybody's talking about toxic masculinity and to, to some degree we, we need to discuss that she gets into that as well but it's not so much toxic masculinity as much as it is there's a toxic war on biblical masculinity oh, and i know sure. you just sat down with nancy piercy a couple of weeks ago i watched yeah. that podcast that was fantastic but dr piercy 
she exposes that there is this attitude right now in our culture against men and not just bad men, not just abusers, you know, but just men in general. Men in general. And you see it, you know, there was this kind of first wave feminism uh, in the late 1900s. Then there was a second wave and we're in what what really is the third wave. Some are saying we're into a fourth wave. Mm. But the leading feminist today says the world needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle. Like that's a direct quote. Saying the world doesn't need men. 100%. Come on. Much like a fish wouldn't ever need a bicycle. But God created men. God created women. They both have purpose. They both have value. They both have roles. And, and to cut out half the population and say unnecessary That's it. is one of the most unbiblical lies we could encounter today. Which, back to the statistics, that's why if this is, if this is any other section or subsection of people. Oh, yeah. Like, not only is it newsworthy, there's probably a move in Congress. Oh, if 79% like, of the suicides were teenagers. If 79% of the t- uh, suicides were children or Generation Alpha, it would, it would still be the one thing we're talking about in the news today. Absolutely. But because it was middle-aged men, bro, I don't think I don't think anybody talking about it. Like, they don't even want to talk about it. Or, or to the worst case, they, they think, well— it's fitting. They're getting what they deserve. I hadn't heard of it till you just shared it. That's it. And 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 what happens is, man, over time, like if you grow up, and, and the reason why I want to talk about this today, bro, is I have young sons. Yeah, yeah. I have three boys. Yeah, I got two boys. That's it. They're growing up in a time, they're growing up in a culture mm-hmm. where automation is telling them their strength is not needed. Come on. Um, artificial intelligence is telling them their wisdom is not needed. Mm. The church is telling them their presence is not needed, right? So they're, they're growing up in this time where, where literally everything around them is basically saying, we don't really need you. Like, oh, we don't yeah. need your manhood. We don't, we don't need your masculinity. In a, in a powerful study, man, recently done by Jim McNamara, Dr. Jim McNamara. He's a, mm. he's a famous researcher out of England. He brought his entire team over to the States, and, and they sit down, and over the course of a few weeks, they, they looked at 2,000 channels hmm. of mass media. Yeah. So everything from USA Today to the New York Times to daytime talk show, like mm. any, any medium, thousands of channels of, of communication. Sure. And, and the research team, all they did was just make a note every time a man was mentioned. Hmm. Just make a note, right? This is what they discovered 80% of the time that we talk about a man in our culture, we talk about him in one of four lights. He's either a villain, a womanizer, a pervert, or an aggressor. That, that's the overwhelming picture of men that's being painted in media today. Overwhelming. Men are this way, they almost are almost exclusively. If you're a man, you're a womanizer, uh, you're a pervert, uh, you're an aggressor, you're a villain. Oof. That's what you are. And 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 my fear, and, and this is... You know, I know the Bible says, "Don't be afraid." I'm, th- this is a holy fear, like, mm. like, like this is a, a, um, again, a sound the alarm. Yeah, I've got young men growing up in this oh, yeah. culture that's basically telling them, not only are you useless, yeah, but you're the problem. Oof. And, and media has been headed that way for a while, right? And, and this is, like you said, this is a concern because you know, I think about my boys. You think about your boys. You know, the average American today watches seven hours of screen a day. Right. The average American adult today spends 40% of their waking hours watching a screen. Yeah. 40%. Like, that's what we're doing with our lives right now in, in this culture. And you're saying 80% of the time that men are mentioned on those screens, in that media, they're, they're mentioned in this negative light. And so, of course, the assumption, the conclusion that our culture is drawing is we don't need a man whatsoever but Nancy Piercy, in her book, she makes this great distinction between what kind of men are not needed and what kind of men are needed. And in the opening of her book, she tells a story about a shooting that took place in Colorado. Mm-hmm. And she tells a story of two young men. One was a young man who walked in and, and started shooting, killed many people. The other was a story of some young men who threw over a table, put all the women in there behind that table, then shielded them with their bodies, with their backs to the shooter, protecting those ladies, taking bullets for them, 
when, when the guy started reloading, they broke a window and got every one of them out. They would go out the window with one, come back in and rescue more. They saved many lives. And in her story, she's saying, okay, yeah, if you're talking about the shooter, no, men or women, no, no culture needs that, right? right? But you're talking about those strong men selflessly sacrificing themselves for others, saving others, using their strength for good, using their strength to help the weaker. We need those men, she says. Yeah. Dr. Pierce says, yes, we need men like that. And But those stories are not portrayed in the media. No. And so we're not, draw, we're not coming to that conclusion. We need godly men, strong men, sacrificial men. We're coming to the conclusion we don't meet, need men at all. Yeah, well, I mean, and think about, think about, let's just talk about media, right? Yeah. Think about the last 10 movies you've watched mm. or, um, you know, I've got, I've got little kids. So Disney, uh, is, oh, yeah. is on in my house, right? Think about the last time you've seen a male figure that was a hero. Oh, well you do, you, don't. you don't. In fact, uh, you and I were talking about, I read a dissertation out of Liberty university it came out in 2013, uh, David McGee and Bryce Hantla. They did some great research and they kind of compiled six different studies into their dissertation. And the studies all looked at media from TV shows, sitcoms, movies, commercials to see how have men been, been portrayed and how has that changed since the 50s, 60s. And you and I have talked about this. And what they discovered in their dissertation and their research is that in the 50s, 60s, 70s, Men in sitcoms, for example, were portrayed as the provider of the family, the, the leader of the family. Mm. People would go to them. Their kids would go to them for wise counsel, and they'd receive it. If there was a problem, a lot of times they were part of the solution, helping yeah. resolve it. They were only made fun of maybe once an episode. They actually counted how many times the joke was at the father's expense. You had shows like Father Knows Best uh, whenever that came out, right? And then they started seeing this trend change with those waves of feminism. And by the late 80s, early 90s, we went from I Love Lucy, Father Knows Best, Andy Griffith Show, to Married with Children, mm. The Simpsons, mm. where the father now, he's the butt of the joke, not once an episode, but nearly five times an episode, yeah. where instead of being the one that kind of helps resolve problems, he's the one creating the problems, making a mess for mm. his wife to clean up, even shows like King of Queens, where you got a man who works hard and provides for his family, he's also the one that makes the mess. He, he's a buffoon that's, you know, just messing everything up, and his wife's having to come in and fix it. And so you have now two generations that has grown up, and that's the number one way that they have seen men portrayed. And yeah. you look at our sons, how, how are they going to see themselves? How are they going to see their own manhood, understand that, if that's all they're hearing? Absolutely. And if you if you zoom out, which the study you're referencing is, is or the dissertation is really good. If you zoom out, I call this, I call this the positive, neutral, and negative view of masculinity. Mm. So, so there was a time in our country where manhood and masculinity, and I'm not talking about the secular script of manhood, I love how Nancy Piercy talks about there's two competing scripts. Yeah. Or she calls it programs, right? Mm -hmm. You download it. Yeah. Right? There's that there's that secular script, which we're all agreeing. Toxic masculinity, hyper alpha male masculinity, oh, yeah. misogynistic masculinity. That is bad. Yeah. It is evil. It is sinful. No one needs that. Right. What I'm talking about is is God's design for masculinity. Yeah. God's di on. design. There was a time in our country where that was viewed positively. Mm. Mm -hmm. God's design for man, a man's role in his home, a man's role in his marriage, a man's role in society, oh, yeah. a man's role in the church. It was held in a positive light. Everyone looked at it and mm. said, when a man was doing what he's been called and designed to do, it's a oh, good yeah. thing. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, in the late 70s, into the 80s, there, there was adopted kind of a neutral view of this, mm. where um, if a man did it, great. If he didn't do it, that was okay. Mm. It really doesn't matter. Yeah, because uh, we began to confuse gender roles. Mm -hmm. We began to uh, to place a higher value on things that that weren't weren't biblical. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, uh, we begin to embrace the secular script. Yeah, and then you get into the to the 90s and to the early 2000s, and it goes from a positive to neutral to a negative to view. negative view. Now, if a man acts like a man, it's a bad thing. Mm. 
Yeah, right. you almost have to apologize for even being a man. You're in a culture that says we don't need a man. It, it's a negative view whatsoever. I mean, there, there's no positive light at all. Being 100%. Shown. Yeah. And like you said, yes, we have abusers, we have toxic masculinity, and we reject that. We don't need that. Absolutely. We call them to repent. But when you have a godly man who loves, serves, provides, sacrifices himself for others, the response, the conclusion is still negative. Yeah. The view of that man is still negative. Yeah, that's that's archaic. That yes. is you know, a patriarchal system that is oppressive, yes. right? You hear those things. And, and, and I love how, how, a me, how, how our media today treats order mm. as oppressive mm. when really order is life-giving. Yes. Like when things are in order, yes. life flourishes. When yeah. things are in disorder and chaos, oh, yeah. life, life declines. And we see right. it in our culture, right? I mean, you mentioned the All suicide the rate. We, we see it on every level. The, the Generation Alpha right now, they say, is the most confused generation in American history. Ever. Of course they are, right? We're, we're telling them we don't know what a man is, what a woman is. You get to decide these things. And it's just pride, right? It's all, and all of us struggle with pride. I wrestle with pride. But when God brings in order... When God designed something, creates something, and he says, this is a man, this is a woman, this is what marriage is, this is what family looks like, this is how to be a husband, this is how to be a wife, right? He has this beautiful design, and what do we do? We come along and we say, I got a better idea. That's right. I got a better way. How, how about this? And we throw away his blueprint, and we create our own, and, and then we're surprised when the house we build all comes crashing down, That's right? It. Unless God's design is the foundation of the house, the house will fall. Yeah, somebody asked me recently to sum, sum this up. Yeah. And I said, well, in the 1940s, men lied about their age so that they could go fight in World War II. Mm, young men saying they're older so That's they could it. go fight. So they could go fight. Today, men lie about their gender so they can beat girls in sports. <laughs> Yeah. That's how far we fall. That's telling. That's how confused we are. We used to lie about our age so we could go defend our country. Today we lie about our gender so we can win medals. <sighs> Confusion, chaos, disorder, and we wonder why men are offing themselves. And when a man does lie about his gender and goes and dominates a woman's sport, the culture we live in celebrates that. Celebrates it. They had a time where uh, recently where a man lied about his gender, and he and a female tied in the sport. They only had brought one medal. They gave it to him. Sure. And when the, and when she asked why why does he get it, you know, they said, well, it, it's a better story, and we yeah, need to yes. celebrate that. A better story. Come on, but. We're writing a horrible story, it's, it's, and, it's actually, and we uh, already, it's not like we're saying, I bet 10 years from now we'll see consequences of this. Like, we see consequences immediately. 100%. It is affecting men, women, marriage, children, family, church, culture. It's affecting the next generation, all right? They, they are the most anxious, depressed, confused generation in history, and there's got to be, at some point, a, a shift where the main voice being heard it is the voice that is championing the biblical truth of what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman. Uh, I, when my boys were even real young, my son Silas is my oldest son, and even at a young age, I started teaching what it means to be a young man, right? Little things like, man, you hold the door for everybody, especially every girl. And, and I tell you, if you're with my son Silas and you're about to go to a door, I guarantee you, you will not have to touch that door. He will run up, beat yeah. you to the door. He'll open the door. He opens every. He opens doors that are locked, right? Like he's going to open every door for everybody. Another thing I started teaching him at a young age, I said, look, bud, I said, when I'm gone, if I'm out of town traveling, speaking somewhere, I said, your mom is in charge. I said, but you're the man of the house. And I tell him this when he was four, you know, and he's like, what does that mean? I was like, well, you're the oldest man at that point, so you're the man of the house. He goes, what does that mean? I said, here's what that means, bud. I said, right now at your age, if you're the man of the house and I'm gone, the man of the house has to get rid of things that don't belong. Come on. He has to bring in things that do belong. And your sister and your mama, they hate bugs. So if I'm gone and there's a bug in the house, the house has to take care of that bug. Let's go. And he got so fired up. He got excited. He leaned into it. He's like, all right. And so I'd be out of town and my wife would call me. And she'd be like, there was a bug in the house. And my daughter, Gracie, yelled, Silas, there's a spider. And he would drop what he's doing, grab a shoe, and he'd be like, I'm on it. And he'd walk across <laughs> the house, kill that thing, get rid of it. 
But that's how intentional we have to be with these young men is somebody has to biblically teach them what does it mean to be a young man? What does it mean to grow up into a man of the house who serves his family, sacrifices for his family, loves his family, spiritually leads them, pointing them to Christ? He gets rid of the things that don't belong in the house, and he brings in the things that need to be in the house. Bro, there is so much gold in what you just said. So much gold in what you just said because no one lives in neutral. Yeah. We are either adopting a secular script yeah. or we are adopting a sacred script. And mm. and no one learns that sacred script by osmosis. Yeah. Like it has to be taught. Yeah. So so when I talk about sounding the alarm today, mm. one, I'm talking to to older men right now saying, Hey, listen, wake up. Yeah. Right. Um, we're losing. Mm -hmm. I know the media is saying that that men are still on top of the world. I know they're saying that we've still had more men presidents and men senators and men mm -hmm. governors and and more men are CEOs of Fortune 500 mm -hmm. companies. And 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 I'm not saying that there are not disparage. Like like I understand there are some things that are still unequal. Yeah. You know, I believe a woman should be paid as much as a man for doing the same job. Like, like this is this is not any type of sexist conversation we're having. Sure. But the reality is the pendulum has shifted. Oh yeah. Where where prior to Title IX, men were were twelve to thirteen points ahead of women in education. Mm. They are now thirteen to fourteen points behind women in education. Yeah. Title IX shifted the game. Mm. Yet no one's making a fuss about that. No one's talking about that. No one's talking about the fact that men are not graduating from college. No mm -hmm. one's talking about the fact that men are not um, getting professional degrees. No one's talking about the fact that most Christian schools, Bible colleges and seminaries are becoming convents mm -hmm. because they're enrolling two women for every one guy today. Oh, yeah. No one's talking about that. So, so we're losing academically. Yeah. No one's talking about the fact that, and I shouldn't say no one. Yeah, There are guys like Richard Reeves and the Brookings Institute and stuff like that that are trying to sound the alarm on this. Yeah, But, but media is not picking it up. No, We're not talking about the fact that there are almost 10 million men unemployed in the workforce today, that they no longer know what to do with their strength. They no mm -hmm. longer know what to do with their hands, right? Yeah. Um, we're not talking about the fact that 80% of suicides are men, that the majority of people incarcerated are men, that the majority of people that are reporting depression on drugs, medications, are, they're men. Men mm. are literally winning every statistical oh, yeah. category you shouldn't be winning. <laughs> yes. And that's not to say that women should be winning. No. No one should be winning. Right. Which is my point. Yes. But we are losing a generation of men. You know, yes. and we're not saying, yeah, we want women to lead in these categories or men to lead in these. What we're saying is the prayer is to see the, the ones that God has made as female in his image, that they would thrive as the women that God has called them to be. And the, those who have been made male in his image, that they would thrive as the men God has called them to be. And what we're not seeing is that thriving. Right. right? And, I, and I'm, I'm a little, man. that's right. And I'm a little salty because for decades, women got help. Mm. Women got um, help from our government. They got help from the Supreme Court. They got help from from communities and foundations. And 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 there has been this buildup because of second wave and third wave feminism. There's been this buildup that mm. that we had to to correct some societal wrongs, which I agree with. Mm -hmm. But now that men are literally drowning, yeah, Lord, nobody's throwing a vest. Now, and the hope would be that the church would be on the front lines of that, right? Like the prayer would be that right now the church, because I think you talked about the, the views of, of manhood going from positive to neutral to negative, right? And so it seems like when it was a positive view, when even secular culture had kind of a positive view of manhood, the church probably didn't feel like they really needed to talk a lot about it. That's right. Hey, everybody kind of agrees that this is good. But now where we're at, because seven hours a day on screens, 80% of the time that men are ever mentioned, they're being portrayed in a very negative, unbiblical light. And we have young men growing up, and that's all that they're seeing. That's the nar narrative they're hearing. The church needs to be on the front lines of speaking truth to the young men. That's right. The, the older men watching this right now, there is a calling for you to disciple younger men. The younger men watching this right now, the prayer is that you would find a church that will teach you how to be a, a young man according to the word of God, not the word of the world. 
What yeah. does it mean to live out the life God has called you to? And again, it, it comes back to being able to love, serve, sacrifice, provide, protect, right? It, it's, it's an others-focused life to the glory of God. And, and imagine if we had a generation of men living like that. That, yeah. that would bless the culture on every level. That would bless children, teenagers, women, the workplace, the government, the schools, Everybody would be blessed by a generation of men who are loving and serving and sacrificing and providing and protecting to the glory of God. That's it, dude. My three, my three young boys. So if you were to ask me today, as we kind of wrap up, man, Harp, what's one thing we can do to kind of turn the tide? And this is for fathers, grandfathers, uncles. This is for pastors. Mm. One of the things I've started doing with my sons is just reinforcing the fact that the world needs them. That's good. That's I'm just good. telling them that. That's good. I'm telling my three year old son, hey, hey, son, the world needs your strength. Yeah. The world needs your wisdom. Mm -hmm. The world needs your presence. Yeah. Like the world is a better place because you're in it. Yeah. Come your on. home will be a better place because you're in it. Your community will be a better place because you're in it. Your church mm -hmm. is a better place because you're in it. Any pastor that watches our show, I would challenge them the next Sunday. From the pulpit, look at the men of your congregation and tell them our church is better because you're here. Absolutely. And Absolutely. they need to hear that on the regular. Yeah, especially when, as we mentioned before in another episode, you know, what is it, 61% of the church right now is female. 100%. Only 39% is male. Men aren't showing up at the church. When you stand up from the pulpit and you do see that 39% of men, you see those men there, they are the ones showing up. They are the ones trying to lead out. Let's honor that. Let's celebrate that. And let's reiterate, hey, we need more of this. Let's encourage Praise God you. for you. Come on. I just I was just with one of the largest, most prominent churches in the country. Hmm. I'm not going to say who it was. Hmm. Their leadership came to me and said, hey, we want you to come and, and teach on manhood masculinity. We need to do a better job of engaging our men. Hmm. So I laid out this multi-generational, gender-based discipleship plan, and it was great. But at the end of the day, they said, hey, all this is good, but what can we do tomorrow? Hmm. What can we do tomorrow to yeah. help turn the tide? Yeah, we love the three-year plan, but what about tomorrow? tomorrow? Come on. And I, I, I simply said, have all of your door greeters, have all of your parking lot greeters, have everyone in your church staff, when they see a man, hmm. when they see a husband walking across the parking lot with his family, when they see a young college man bringing himself to church, carrying his Bible, just pull him aside and encourage him. Yeah. Come just on. look at him and say, man, I see you. I'm proud of you. That's good. Man, keep going. It's hard to live a righteous life, a holy life in this in this, you know, fallen world, man. We see you, we're here for you. Mm -hmm. No more dad jokes. No more poking fun at the expense of men. No more guilt, shame-ridden sermons, right? Yeah. We're calling men out, but we're calling them up to something more. We have That's got good. to start encouraging men. And I know people may listen to that and say, "Well, that sounds so trite or that sounds so simplistic." Men are so discouraged today. Oh yeah, they're, they're being the ones who do go to church. They're being lumped in with the worst of the worst. That's we'll it. talk about the worst of the worst men we can imagine, and then just apply that to all these guys. That's right. And it does. It beats you down. It discourages you. Dude, we are on a mission to encourage men. I love it. The world is better because they're here. Yeah, I'm gonna start with my sons, Come encouraging on, them. I love it. That's it. I'll see you next time, dude. All right.